What is going on, everybody? Welcome into another edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up here on this gorgeous Tuesday, June 13th, 2023. As always, I'm your humble correspondent, Michael Tanner, coming to you from an undisclosed location here in Dallas, Texas, joined by the executive producer of the show, the purveyor of the show, and the director and publisher of the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com, Stuart Turley. My man, how are we doing today? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Got a wild show. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, a very interesting show. We've got some pretty funny headlines, which I like. Love a good headline day. Um, not a great day for oil prices, but we'll have that funeral later in the show. Um, first up, we've got Shell pivots back to oil to win over investors um, in a move everybody saw coming. Um, Shell kind of <laughs> flipped back, and they're back into oil now. So who would have thought? Shell's getting out of oil, now they're back into it. But uh, Stu will cover what's going on and what came out of their investor meeting they had today. Next up, Saudi Arabia signs $5.6 billion deal with Chinese EV company. Um, Saudi Arabia Ministry of Investment and went ahead and inked this deal with Human Horizons in an attempt to collaborate on some manufacturing um, and sale of vehicles. So super interesting deal. Stu will cover what that means. What's interesting is the next article he's covering is how world domination is within Tesla's grasp. Um, we know that the fall, you know, I think this is mostly going to cover the fallout um, from um, Elon Musk's visit to China, where there was some interesting news about how they're going to be collaborating going forward. Um, next up and um, on, on the news side, more oil, fewer U.S. rigs. Hey, Saudi, something here to see. So um, we see a theme running throughout the show. Um, I'm sure Stu will weave all of that in together. He'll toss it over to me. And I mean, oh man, we'll, we'll we'll talk about what's going on with oil down four percent today. We're currently sitting at about um, sixty seven um, dollars right now, so not not good at all, unfortunately. But I will cover what's going on, what the fallout is, and maybe what to expect from the U.S. Fed meeting um, here this Wednesday. Um, and then we'll let you get out of here. It's uh, fairly quiet on the oil and gas news front, um, so we'll be able to get you out of here nice and quick, guys. But first, before I kick it back to Stu, as always. Check us out, world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all of your oil and gas and energy news. Stu does a great job of curating that to make sure it's up to speed with everything. Dashboard.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your uh, energy and data news combo. We are hard at work at V2, mocking up a bunch of really cool stuff. So please, guys, check that out. Get it while you still can before it goes behind that paywall. We are working hard on a uh, uh, our, our new subscription model, um, specifically for the website. So for all you lawyer viewers, um, we appreciate um, everybody. I mean, we're, we're to the point where our firewall is is saving the day for us. So we've you know we've got so many people. Stu's got all his Russian comrades trying to hit the site that we need. <laughs> to uh, make sure that we've got our firewall up. But again, we appreciate everybody. Check out, we'll be rolling out more details on what that um, new subscription looks like for all our, what we'll call our loyal fans, our analysts, everybody who's into the news. Um, we'll have to come up with some catchy tiers like analyst, you know, SVP, executive level. We'll come up. We'll come up with some stupid, catchy brandings um, that we'll spend way too much time on, and we'll assign no value to it. But uh, again, guys, energynewsbeat.com. It's where all these stories come from. Hit the description below. You can jump to the timestamps. Um, I'm out of breath, though, Stu. Where do we want to begin? All right. Uh, Shell pivots back to oil to win over investors. This is after Michael, you and I have been talking about BP and uh, Exxon and their uh, uh, other big boys around the world here in the U S um, oxy was the only one that was really staying on course, but this was really interesting. The CEO wow swans effort to regain investor confidence as the energy giant wrestles with poor returns from renewables while oil and gas profits are booming company resources say that's even at the lower dollar amount michael mm -hmm. so there's some numbers in here let's go through shell produced about 1.5 million barrels per day bpd gotta love that one uh of oil in the first quarter of 2023 representing a 20 percent decline from 2019 production of 1.9 million barrels per day they say now uh, output's going to be remaining largely flat and could slightly rise. 
But let's come down here to returns from oil and gas typically range between 10 to 20 percent, while those for solar and wind projects tend to be five to eight percent. There's the bottom line problem returns. Now, I'm going to put a crayon to that on things that I know, and that crayon is not is way not good because that five to eight is figuring not figuring in the tax problems or the maintenance issues as it comes in there it's not create it's not comparing oranges to apples it's bad i mean you you also have to remember this is a huge shift in strategy for shell in 2021 they announced by the end of the decade they were going to cut oil output by 20 percent then they walked it back and said that was under review a few right. months later. Then they today walked the walked it back from, well, actually, we're probably not going to do that. And what's interesting is how were they supposed to reach those production cuts? By selling oil and gas assets. So <laughs> you remember when somebody tells you they're going to lower oil and gas production and they're over in the jise of or in the ruse of ESG, they're just selling it to somebody who's probably going to operate it in a less energy in, efficient and a less compliant manner. They're probably the selling it. Selling it. So yeah, they're probably it selling is, it to Putin. Yeah. <laughs> and get this mix. We, you know, you know, the CEO, his name is uh, what's his name? Um, Schlon. You know, uh, Wes Slon, Canadian yeah. Lebanese. Interesting combo. Yeah. Um, but when you sit back and take a look at Shell, Shell and Equinor and Total Energy, these were those were all on the same board of uh, going poo poo to you on oil, and they were running as fast as they could. All three of them are having to backpedal. Yeah, so, you I know. That was pretty um, cool. <laughs> I do find it funny. Returns from oil and gas typically range between ten and twenty percent. I wonder where they got those numbers from because. I, I, yeah, it does not make sense. Well, um, no, what I'm saying is that seems a little that, low considering what gets yes. floated around the business. But between you, me, and the fence post, they're probably right. Because well, it's probably it, not as it's not as high. Unless, I mean, you're obviously you're fluctuating with oil prices. And that's where we right. say returns from oil and gas typically range between this percent and this. percent. You're always caveating on with that is this band of oil prices, because obviously if oil went to three hundred dollars. Right we might have some thousand IRR wells. Right. But that five to 8% doesn't even match up because the meantime between failure on all the wind turbines and everything else, these things don't start making money till after 10 years. How can that number of five to 8% profit when you can't even get them hooked into the, the grid for several years? I'm calling eh, on that one. So anyway, Let's go on here. <laughs> I loved your. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I, I loved your an analyzation on that. Okay. Next one, we have Saudi Arabia signs $5.6 billion deal with Chinese EV company. Michael, I've been telling you for a long time. They're not like um, uh, Shell and Total Energy and, you know, all the others by not just bailing out and going to EV. Saudi Arabia has been, oh, by the way, we're going to make money until the day it is no longer pumped. And we're going to then use that to pay for our social programs. And we're going to go green and we're going to pay for green. Now they're doing it where they're also working with China and in this article, Chinese foreign direct investments into Arab markets stood at $23 billion in 2021, of which $3.5 billion, as in Saudi Arabia, the Saudi statement said. Um, that's going around. It's going to be for more than half of the $10 billion investments signed on the first day of an Arab-China business conference in Riyadh. Well, it's 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 two countries that if you're from if you're the United States, you don't want them dealing with each other and becoming buddies. It was really already, nice when they were cold hearted enemies and not enemies in the sense of like, oh, we're going to go to war, but just do different trajectories. Do things. This is this. It starts getting spooky, Stu. Oh, this on top of bricks. 
very spooky. Oh, so. spooky. I mean, even as we're trying to get into bricks as the, our podcast, but nonetheless. Hey, um, bricks will sponsor it. And, you know, they'd issue us visas, you know, and unlimited visas as sponsorships. Okay. Let's go to the next one here. Uh, Talk about scary. How world domination is within Tesla's grab. I need to hear this one. Okay, listen to this one. Imagine a firm where, let me read you these bullet points, where all managers and staff are expected to work as entrepreneurs with no budget limits, constraints, or spending, performance reviews done by the staff, not the bosses, Mm -hmm. practically no managers, no controls from HR. Oh, we got to implement that here at Sandstone. No career planning, no managerial ladder to climb um welcome to tesla (laughs) i just i love the way he's thinking about this he's also demanding everybody show back up to the office what do you think about that michael well i mean i think you have to put the office conversation aside because i think it's a nuanced conversation i think there there are things about the in-person experience that is hard to replicate and is impossible to replicate via zoom now right. there's something to be said about hybrid work in my opinion doesn't work because Why's now that? well unless it's done on a consistent company basis that the entire company works on monday everybody goes to work everybody stays home on tuesday everybody shows uh, up on wednesday yes. versus what like my brother has where you know it's you know he works for medtronic which is you know a fortune 50 company you can it's hybrid. You work whenever you can show up to the office. You cannot show up to the office. And it causes confusion and not confusion, but right. you end up when you go to the office, you end up still engaging and interacting with people in a virtual way. So it lessens the impact of the office when there is nothing more powerful than four people around a whiteboard trying to map out a solution. Oh, you absolutely. can't beat that. You can't beat that solution. Now, do I think remote work is a positive thing and, and entry people? Uh, should be embraced, of course, because there's something, I mean, there's something like when, when you talk about focus and being able to like get focused quality work done, it can, it can be hard in office. Trust me. I deal with that more than anybody. I got to put a do not, I literally have a do not disturb sign on my office because you've got people that don't care and just boom, walk in. They don't care if your door is shut, you know? So getting focused consistent work can be hard at the office and so that's why i think in an ultimate case there's a balance but i see major pushbacks from hybrid so i'd lean one way or the other he leans in person great i I, you know i'm not looking to work at tesla conveniently what i think is interesting is no career planning that's hilarious no controls from hr sounds fun to me honestly practically no managers performance reviews done by staff that's smart all about that very intel did that as well Here's here's where it all comes down to it. You also get into the new AI and agile systems in here. It all boils down to this. The result of everything that we talked about is uh, the result is a radically different kind of company. Tesla can make up to 60 model changes per day to its vehicles per day, whereas the other auto manufacturers are making model changes every three to five years. Elon's brilliant. It doesn't matter what company he's done. His management and employee processes transcend um, markets. Um, Yeah. I mean, what he's doing is he's, is he's creating a culture in which if you are passionate about electric vehicles, if you are passionate about software, if you are passionate about doing stuff that other people said is impossible, you're going to love to work here because there's no barriers. There's no constraints on how you can work. Now, some people don't like that. Some people love the bureaucracy and need right. the bureaucracy. And they need that five layers of management like I had this morning. I had, you know, I had four meetings back to back to back to back. And you know how much got accomplished at those meetings? Z- Zero. It's insane. So I'm yeah. with them on no meetings. Well, my dad, uh, who was a very uh, uh, a executive commander in the military, he had a rule of 15 minutes, unless it was a very, very big meeting. It was 30 minutes. And if you couldn't get uh, you couldn't get past that sentence, you're out and he's on to the next person. There's a lot you can get done that way. 
Yeah, I mean, meetings should be reserved for there is an <laughs> issue you have with somebody, and the only thing we need to do is is hash out the issue. That's what a meeting is for, or presenting findings in a way in like a to an audience of more than like three people. If your meeting is three people, eh, email. If you have to invite more than you know, there's got to, there's some threshold of people where okay, this qualifies as a meeting. Also, just the fact that most meetings are they're, they're just they're pointless. I don't want to get thrown off track. Okay, I've, for weeks I've been steaming on this, so you've touched a nerve with that. Um, let's go over. Let's go back to Saudi Arabia. What's going on there? Um, well, we've already covered Saudi. Well, aren't we more oil, fewer U.S. rigs? Oh, hey, yeah, oh Saudis, yeah. Sorry, sorry. There's something I, to see here. Thank you. More oil, fewer rigs. Hey, Saudis, there's something to see here. This one's a bit more of a dialogue with the U.S., Michael. And U.S. drillers have the potential to double oil output from existing wells. Thanks to new, wells? new drilling uh, efficiency and innovation, such as shale well refracturing. Um, yeah, that's hot now. Everyone's all hot on refracts. That was all. Well, that was the. That was all the hot news at uh, Hard Energy. I'm skeptical at best. Tell me about it. Tell me what you want or what what you're hearing. I'm skeptical that refracts work. I think that most. I think that there's a when people pitch refracts. I think 50 percent right. of the time it's just the depleted zone. Oh well, perfect on the well. Oh well, we got to go clean up the perfs. Uh, maybe it's just depleted. Like maybe it's just a bad well, and refracting it is dumping a little bit more money into it to get some marginal output, you know, because the problem with refracts is this, right? You judge the economics of the refract base. So refracts gonna be half the cost of a well. Okay. Right. So let's say you go in and refracture it. They almost always show payout because your costs are like 70% less than drilling because you're only talking about completing it. So, you know, right. everyone wants to go run these refracture economic analysis, but they, they don't tell you anything because the question is, usually you don't see an, in, you know, people say, well, you're, you're guaranteed to see an increase in production, but are you? There's a chance you shut the well and it doesn't come back on. There's a chance you frack the thing and it comes on the exact same. You know what that means? Depleted zone. So I, we, we, we have a potent, the potential to double output. Sure, I have the potential to double my income here in the next six months. Is it going to happen? No. Well, is there enough data on refractured wells to get yeah, in? Because, okay, well, the reason I say that is you but are the an problem animal. is it's You're fractionalized an... within companies. There's not necessarily, you can't um, go on in Veris and see, show me all the refract wells. Wow. You have to, someone at Exxon who has a database of a thousand refract wells is going to be very easy, can much more, can give you a better opinion on, okay. here's how refractors work, but they only have data on wells that they've refracted. So you have to talk about how do those parameters compare across basin? Do they? And that's where I, you know, not to just cut you off right in the beginning, but if, if you're telling me that this whole article is based on re, uh, refracking wells, I'm out. Let me short this. Well, no, it, and uh, this all came down to from the CEO of ExxonMobil, Darren Woods, commenting about it. So that they have the databases in order to take a look and say, hey, whether it is. Uh, but if ExxonMobil was right, then the U.S. may be only on the cusp of another revolution in production. So they're betting big on it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so it's it's pretty interesting because one of his quotes is, you know, there's a lot of oil being left in the ground. I agree with, you know. We, you know, okay. I agree, agree with that. Fracking's been around for a really long time, but the science of fracking is not well understood. And I'll agree there. This was interesting. When I was a drilling engineer, a well's max lateral length was typically 5,000 feet. Now it's 10,000 feet. Many are pushing 15,000 feet. So you've effectively drilled two wells in a lot less time as the vertical blah, blah, blah. So production footage is the same with fewer works. Well, that doesn't mean that you're leaving oil. That's just getting more oil in less in less shot that's being more right. efficient that's not necessarily doubling oil output so again this is where they talk out of both sides of their mouth oh we need to get more efficient with fracking but really all we're doing is drilling longer wells so that we get more eu you right. know we have you know we're having a you know there are economics of scale around that again but i the, am skeptical okay and uh you know we've been seeing this um 
uh, when I was at a lunch with Harold Ham, and I'm still trying to get him on the podcast, by the way. Um, and he was talking about the number of uh, efficiencies in wells that he's seeing. Um, you sit back, higher drilling efficiencies is why U.S. oil production is again heading for annual highs, while the rig count has dwindled to 55 post-pandemic of 627. Yeah, here we go. Alex Kimney, energy engineer and research. He literally says this in a quote right here. Refract can be something of a booster shot for producers. Oh, that's a good analogy. You want your booster shots, Stu? Stu's down for the booster. You I'm not Shell doing needs any. Booster. It needs its second booster and its third one. I am never doing any <laughs> boosters or <laughs> shots quote, again. I'm your article. Refract can be something of a booster shot for producers. A quick increase in output for a fraction of the cost of developing a new well. Again, I told you. All of these refract economics look good. What I mean is that, yes, you're obviously in a refracture scenario going to assume you're going to see an increase in output. But again, it's a fraction of the cost of developing a new well. Oh, my goodness. 800% so the, IRR. Yeah, but the there's, real a, winners, there's a 10% chance you, you shut the well into frack it, you turn it on, it doesn't turn on. So the real winners of this are the oil field service companies like Liberty Frack. Oh, Chris right over there is going to be licking his chops on this one. Yeah, we we, we, we love ResFrac. We've interviewed and, and know Garrett Fowler over there very well. He's the yes. COO. He was quoted in this article as saying they can be up to 40% cheaper. So, again, that's, uh, um, you know, um, not a fraction of the cost. That's about a little less than half. But it gives you an idea of how much fracks are of drilling costs. So, I mean, when someone tells you a $10 million right. well, think $4 million of that's going to the frac. If you're in pure West Texas and you're going – high volume, high water, slick water frack. I mean, you, it's 6 million bucks. If you're doing say 2 million to 10 million pounds, of, you say you're doing 10 million pounds of sand. <laughs> Fire the babies up. And if you want to use Liberty's quiet frack fleet, add another 250 K on that. Sucks to uh, suck. More than that. But uh, I'm out on refracts, not out on refracts. I shouldn't say I'm out. I'm skeptical because I don't think there's as much meat on the bone there. And if that's all that this article is basing its statistics on in order to say we're going to double, eh, I'm good. Whoever this Alex guy is, come on the podcast. Let's debate. Let's debate because I'm not investing in this. I'll reach out to him uh, because that's important. When I read this, I was like, man, I got to I got to get Michael on this one. He's going to be so proud of me. I got a good article for him. One of the quotes, considering inflation, supply chain issue, rising wages, I'm all for that, um, and a great time for operators to start looking at wells for refract opportunities. Again, this, I'm, uh, 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 just drill, but I, again, I just have the issue that most, in my, in my experience, refracts, it's like a 50-50 shot whether they work, and then, then, then what? It's a depleted zone. My bad. Now, maybe in, again, I think when you get into some of these core shale basins, which are a lot tighter formations who are maybe right. fracked with older technology, there's that opportunity, but there's only so much lateral length you have. So it'll right. be interesting to see if, again, I'm out on the refrack. I'm out on the booster shot. Then you're out on the need, booster. And no booster. I, I love how you. that's his the booster shot. Don't tell me refract that's not going to encourage me to get on your point when you start calling no. it a booster no you lose me at booster because i would curl up in the fetal position throw up and then i'd like get my armament and start playing death invaders or some computer game i'm never taking a shot again huh. so well, anyway good. that's it for me man all right. Well, uh, we'll kick it over and uh, and I mean, we'll, we'll have a quick moment of silence for oil and gas prices. Um, that was enough, Amen. but because it was a pretty, <laughs> pretty rough day today, guys. Uh, oil currently trading 6737. That's down four percent today off the back of the S&P and the Nasdaq, both up one and one point seven percentage points, respectively. Again, what's going on? 
is 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 mainly due to the U.S. Fed meeting this week. It's expected that they're not going to raise rates, but it's there's an expectation that with the economy continuing to show life in it, that in not this meeting but the following meeting in July they will raise rates. So I think people are are are, are fairly can I don't want to say concerned about it, but I think they are definitely um, the sentiment around where oil prices are going are are not good. We saw Goldman Sachs. Um, yesterday, go ahead and cut their oil price forecast. So they obviously aren't interested in hiring Stu anymore. So we'll be lucky to have him back on the show um, long term, which is awesome. Makes him a little cheaper. He's not he's not cheap, guys. We got to try to keep him around here. He ain't cheap. So uh, thank goodness Goldman Sachs is out of the running now. Um, they did. the And to give you an idea, they brought that down. They brought Brent down to 86 from 95 and specifically um, WTI. They brought down um, to 81 from 80. So they're 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 cutting it hard. Um, good old Kepler analyst Matt Smith, um, one of fifty Kepler analysts named Matt Smith. I mean, I talk, <laughs> go by Matthew, man. We get it. Whatever. Matt Smith. Goldman is capitulating on their bullish price forecast. Appears to have been the catalyst to kickstart selling today. If that's the truth, Matt Smith, we should all go home and quit because I don't want to live in a world where Goldman Sachs oil and gas analysts are kickstarting selling today. But uh, um, if that's the case, it is what it is. Um, we did see some stuff come out from UBS that was talking about um, interest rates are expected to stay the same this month, as I mentioned in the open, but also the, 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 the sentiment is, it, you know, it's they're going to resume next month. And again, this is Robert Yeager. He's at a UBS. Um, they came up with a really long note. Um, and our, the people are really tuning into what Jay, Jay Powell is going to say on his Friday. New, he'll come out about noon and meet. And, you know, if he shocks the world, Stu, and comes out and, and, and high, rate hikes, I mean, we could see $60 oil very quickly. I think that's what people have to realize is if something unexpected happens, who knows? I mean, the market seems to think there's no cuts. We are up, again, a percent on the S&P, green on the NASDAQ. Um, you know, dollar was up a little bit. So I don't think people are as, so again, I think the sentiment around what Jay Powell is going to do, which is going to have a huge effect on oil prices is, um, the same. We saw natural gas trading $2 and 27 cents, um, after, uh, opening just below $2 and 22 cents. Um, so it was good to see that other than that, pretty quiet Stu. I mean, you know, we got Chesapeake releases their corporate sustainability report. So we'll pass on reading that. Um, let somebody else do that. Um, that's really about it guys. Stu, what do you have? What should people be scared about? Um, there's, there's some really stuff coming around the corner. I will go into here in a little bit. I'm working on it. I love it. I'm mostly joking when I say that. And I love how you take me seriously. You just, you sit back and go, Oh man, well, if only you knew what I knew. But then I'd have to club you in the knee and taunt exactly. you hard. But then, you to... <laughs> but then I'd have to kill you. Um, <laughs> then I, then I, then Was I would it Tanya to... Harding that beat the snot out of her with a stick. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. It's okay. true. <laughs> that is funny. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything else. Um, but you know, we'll 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 keep it light. Um, we'll keep it light this week. I know I'm off uh Thursday show, so you'll be stuck with Stu. Um so I just apologize up front. Hopefully uh, you guys will still tune in. But with that, guys, we're going to let you get out of here, get back to work. Um, we appreciate you checking us out. World's greatest podcast, Energy News Beat. Um, for Stuart Turner, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.